We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, 10 o'clock service. Good to see you all here this morning. We're doing something a little different. We just finished up our series through Colossians. Next week, we're starting a series called Angels and Demons. But this week, because there's a pretty big election on Tuesday, we're doing a one-off message called How to Punch Your Ballot Without Punching Your Neighbor. Uh, by the time we're done, some of you may want to change the title to How to Punch Your Ballot Without Punching Your Pastor. Um, I'm not sure how you'll feel by the time I'm done, but I will say when I was getting dressed this morning, my wife asked me not to wear blue or red, and so I got gray on gray. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we normally just focus at this church on preaching the gospel. And so we're not a political church. If this is your first time with us, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is one of those churches. We're not one of those churches. Here's, here's what I would say. I don't believe that the church is getting more political. Arundel Christian Church is not getting more political. I do, though, believe that the government is trying to get more spiritual. And here's why I say that. You know, the government used to kind of just focus on things that the Bible wasn't speaking on, you know, like infrastructure and taxes and budgets and things like that. But when the government starts talking about things and making decisions where God has already spoken, then we as a church, we ought to open it up and say, what does God's word say about this? And so while we're, I promise you, uh, next week, like I said, we're starting another series. Uh, we're getting back into just the, the, the God's word and the gospel. But I think it's important in this moment in time as a church body to see where can we align and where can we uh, understand a few things that are going to be important going into this Tuesday and uh, the weeks following Tuesday and into January. Uh, it's an important season for us. So what can we do as followers of Christ? Now, I, I want to make a few, a few statements before we really get into this. The first thing I want you to know is that oftentimes the world will try to silence your Christian perspective, your voice, by telling you that it's wrong for you to walk into a voting booth and to somehow connect your faith with your politics, that these two things can't go together. They'll even sometimes give it a big scary name and say, hey, if you go into that voting booth and you expect to somehow uh, regulate your faith or you vote a certain way according to your faith, that you're a Christian nationalist or something like that. Well, here's the deal. Every single person who walks into a voting booth, every single one, is going to vote according to their worldview and according to their faith system every single time. They might not have a worldview that they call a faith system. They might say, I don't have any faith. Well, I want you to understand that agnostic or atheist or naturalist worldview, whatever they call, whatever they believe, it's still a faith system. And when they go in to vote, they're going to vote according to the values of their faith system. And so we as Christians, we ought to do the same thing. We ought to go in and stand up for the values that are important to us as followers of Christ. There is nothing wrong with that. And so today we're going to explore what that looks like together. Like I said, by the time I'm done, I'm going to have offended everyone in this room uh, in some way, form, or fashion. Some of you will feel more offended than others. But we can strive, hopefully, to land at a place where we can all agree on some things. Here's the first, the way I'm going to break this down. The first one is how to punch your ballot. The second part is how to not punch your neighbor. And so we're going to talk about both of those. Now let's focus on that first one first. How to punch your ballot. Now here's the very first thing I would say for all of us is that it's important that you do punch your ballot. That's the very first thing I would say is as, you know, as a Christian, one of the things that you can do, I'd say the voting is not just a right, it's, it's a duty. And let me explain why I say that. Do you know that current research by the Barna Group has found that 32 million Christians have, have told surveyors that they do not plan to vote this election cycle? 32 million Christians. The last election was decided by thousands, 
not millions. And so we have an opportunity to make sure our voice is heard by recognizing voting isn't just something you have the right to do, it's something you ought to do. Now, I know for a lot of you, you're disenfranchised or you don't like your options and you're thinking, you know what, I'm not going to vote because I don't want to vote for either of the candidates or I'm going to do something else. And listen, I want to encourage you that maybe by the end of the message today, you'll consider uh, wanting to go in and, and voting for one of your options. All right? Now, let's explore why I think that's important in Scripture. First of all, I want you to know our country— this isn't true for every other country, but our country is what's called a constitutional republic. I want you to know that's different than a democracy. We're not a democracy. We often say we're a democracy, but we're actually in our constitution, a constitutional republic, which means we elect people who represent us, the rulers. We, the people, are in charge. We elect people who are going to represent the values that we care about. And so essentially, when you look at Scripture where it says, Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, they groan. Now, I know what a lot of us, we try to do is we think of the, the people in authority as the people that we elect. But in a constitutional republic, who's in authority in this country? We the people. We elect people to represent us. And so when the godly go out and make their voice heard, we can, uh, we can create a, a godly government. We can create a, an authority system where the godly are calling the shots, where people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. Now, let me show you another reason why you ought to vote. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take it and open it to Jeremiah chapter 29? Jeremiah 29. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, just grab one from the chair in front of you, write your name on it, and take it home for you. I, I, well, you know what I love? We don't have loner Bibles at this church. We have gift Bibles. So if you just needed a Bible, you grab that Bible, put your name in it, and take it home with you. It's the greatest book you'll ever read, all right? Turn to, to Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to look at verse 4. Here's what it says, 4 through 6. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives that he has exiled to Babylon for, from Jerusalem. Now, before we see what God has to say to all the exiles, he's about to tell them a few verses from now that they're going to be exiled in a land that's not theirs for 70 years. Before he says the number 70, this is what he says. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children and then find spouses for them so that you may have grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. You might be thinking, what does this have to do with voting? I want you to understand a perspective here that God's people in this moment, God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah saying, listen, I want you to build homes. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to, to have a, a family, a spouse, and then have grandchildren, find spouses for them so you can have grandchildren. What do all those things have in common? What does building a house and planting a garden and having kids and grandchildren all have in common? They take a lot of time. They also take a lot of money, right? But they take a lot of time. A lot of time. And God's saying, listen, you're going to be in exile for a long time, 70 years. That's a whole generation. And here's how it relates to the church today. If you are a brother or sister in Christ, guess what? This world and this nation, regardless of how patriotic you are, is not your permanent home. This is not your forever address. You are a citizen of heaven. In other words, for about 70 years, maybe on average, you're going to be in exile here. You're going to be living in a land that you're not meant to live forever in. You're going to be here for a while. But what does God say to us living in exile? He says, if you read the next verse in verse 7, he says, And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Another way to translate that for us is I want you to work for the peace and prosperity of the land where you live now. He says, pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. In other words, if the welfare of our country is great, 
we will experience greater welfare. And if the welfare of our country is bad, we will experience a, a bad welfare. And so we have an opportunity as believers, as followers of Christ, to speak into the peace and prosperity of the land where we live in exile. And so here we are. That's why I would encourage you to remember voting is not just a right that we have. It's a duty. You have been placed with tremendous authority to elect people who will represent you and our values. All right, now let me show you. This, this message is going to get uh, uh, a little bit more juicier as we go, okay? Here, here's the next little part I want to share with you. I'm going to show you what I would call some ineligible ballots, some ballots that won't be eligible in the voting booth when you get in there. By the way, how many of you have already voted? How many of you, like, you took care of that, it's done? Okay, quite a few. How many of you haven't voted yet? Now, now keep your hand up. You know, do you, you haven't voted yet, keep your hand up. How many of you are going to vote? Keep your hand up. All right. All right, now this, I want to encourage you, you, you need to vote, okay? And so here's, those of you who haven't voted yet, and those who have voted, you're going to know that these are some ineligible ballots. These weren't on, these weren't some ballots that you didn't get to see. And, uh, and by the way, what I'm going to put on the screen here in just a moment, I want you to know that national elections, local elections, uh, uh, you know, s- state elections, all those, those matter. All those elections are important, and they all are valid. But for the sake of this illustration, I'm not going to show you a ballot that has all those things on it. I'm just going to show you what probably causes the most division, which is the presidential election. It's a thing that's going to get most of the screen time on Tuesday. It's going to have most of the conversations. You're going to see some ineligible ballots on the screen. So let's look at the first one. It's this. It's choose one for vibes. That's not a ballot you're going to see when you go into the the voting, voting booth, right? You're going to see vote one for what? President. You're not going to see one that says, hey, I want you to choose the person who makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. I want you to pick the person whose personality best meshes with yours, the person who gives you the best vibes. Or, listen, voting on something exterior, Scripture has something to say about that, doesn't it? Remember, God says, I don't look at a person's exterior, I look at their heart. I look at something deeper than what they look like on the outside. So listen, I don't know if you want a white president or a black president or an orange president. (laughs) The color of the skin of the person, that's an exterior, more like a vibe issue, right? That's not something that would be a wise thing to consider when you're deciding who you're going to elect president. Another thing would be gender. Maybe you're like, hey, I really want a woman president or I really want a, a male president, that again, that's in, listen, that's a silly way to choose someone who's going to lead your country for four to eight years. We don't want to vote one for vibes. The personality of the person in office will last from four to eight years. Their policies and the platforms and their appointments and the decisions they make, that's going to last in some cases for a lifetime. So don't vote based on vibes. Here's another one. Another ineligible ballot would be vote one for president and where you get that that third option where you're trying to send a message. A lot of us in this room, I'll be honest with you, this is an eligible ballot, right? You will have the option to go in there and vote third party. You'll have an option to write in your grandma's name if you want to. Please don't write in my name. I would make a terrible president, right? A lot of us, when we see a ballot like this, what we do is we think, I'm going to write something on this third line because I want to send a message. Well, I promise you, what we've learned over time is that nobody's getting your message. (laughs) Either Harris or Trump is going to be elected president. We might not know who is elected president for a long time from now, but one of them is going to be elected. And at the end of the day, I want to encourage us when we cast our vote, maybe you disagree with me on this, and you're like, no, I still like my send a message strategy. Listen, you do you. Just make sure you vote. But I would encourage you to think about the impact your vote makes. All right, here's another ineligible ballot, would be vote one for role model. See, a lot of us, we go in and we get confused and we think we're voting for a person who's going to be person of the year or that we're voting on a pastor or voting on a pope. We're not voting for any of those things. We're voting on someone who's going to be the chief executive of the business of our government. 
the executive branch, the CEO of the United States of America. That's who we're electing. We're not, in, we're not electing a role model. In fact, I, can we all agree that if, if your eyes are open, or even if your eyes are closed, both of the candidates that are on the list are pretty stinking flawed? We don't have anyone that I would be like, yeah, this person is someone I would vote for person of the year or pastor of the year or whatever, teacher of the year. No, no we don't got a role model on the ballot as far as I'm concerned. And if you go into that, that booth expecting to find the person that you want to be the role model for your children, well, you're reading the ballot wrong because it says to choose one for president. It would be great if we could choose one for president who was also a role model. Man, that would be great. We'll talk more about that in a second. Here's, the, here's another ineligible ballot. You ready? Vote one for president. Can we all agree this isn't one of our options? It would be great, right? If we could go in there and just say, you know what? I don't like either of the, the two given uh, opportunities, so I'm just going to go ahead and vote for Jesus for president. Well, I got some news for you. There is no perfect candidate on the ballot. There is no Jesus on the ballot. You want to know why Jesus isn't on the ballot? Because he's busy being on the throne, okay? So Jesus isn't going to be on the ballot. Another, I don't have a picture for this, but another ineligible ballot, I find a lot of times people vote, they, they decide who they hate the most, and they just pick the other person. No reasoning, but I just don't like that person, so I'm going to vote for the other option. That would be another ineligible ballot. Let me, let me show you, if you got your notes out this morning, I want you to write, fill in these blanks. In Scripture, we see three different kinds of leaders. And you could see, see all these leaders kind of right next to each other uh, when you read through uh, Kings. And, and specifically, uh, you, you'll, you'll learn more about them in like Second Kings. Uh, let me show you the first one. is a Josiah leader. Write down Josiah leader. Josiah was a king, and Josiah was a righteous king who did good and righteous things. Josiah was awesome. If there's ever a Josiah on the ballot, you want to pick Josiah. It should be a no-brainer. There should be no division. Everybody should be able to recognize righteous person who celebrates and does righteous things. That would be a Josiah leader. This is the kind of person you want your kids to marry. This is the kind of person you want on the cover of Time magazine. This is the kind of person you, 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 you choose as role model. All right, here's another kind of leader is what we call an Ahab or Jezebel leader. An Ahab or Jezebel leader. An Ahab or Jezebel leader is our ungodly people who promote and celebrate wicked things. This is the exact opposite of a Josiah. Josiah is right, our godly people that celebrate godly things. Ahab's and Jezebel's are ungodly people that celebrate and, and promote wicked things. And so the complete opposite. One of the, the, the telltale ways to know if you have an Ahab or Jezebel leader, if you go and study Ahab and Jezebel's leadership in Scripture, and there's a, some signs. You'll know you have an Ahab or Jezebel uh, when cities become lawless, when there are months where evil is celebrated, when perversion is taught to children, when babies are murdered under, under Ahab and Jezebel, there was the, the uh, prophet of, of Baal, and there's this lowercase fake god named Baal, and uh, in, in Baal worship, they would uh, sacrifice babies. Babies were murdered under Ahab and Jezebel. Also under Ahab's and Jezebel's, the godly are persecuted. So if you're trying to figure out if you got an Ahab or Jezebel leader, you look for these things. If cities, are there cities that are lawless? Are there months where evil is celebrated? Is there perversion being taught to children? Are babies being murdered? Are the godly being persecuted? That'll give you a, a telltale sign. Here, here's a third kind of leader. is what we call Jehu leaders. Jehu came after Ahab and Jezebel. Jehus are this. They are flawed people that God uses to do godly things. Flawed people that God uses to do godly things. Here's what Jehu did. Jehu did not follow God. Jehu, uh, most theologians would say Jehu was anointed but not saved. 
God's hand was on him to do some good godly things, but that he wasn't a follower of God. In fact, he went and took all those, those altars to, to false gods and he turned them into toilets. He did some incredible things under his leadership, but he was deeply flawed and was not a follower of God. Now, with all that information, let me, let me point out two very important things that get us all tripped up. Number one, don't find a Jehu and pretend that they are a Josiah. A lot of us, we want to do that, right? We want to find someone who's deeply flawed, but God has is, is, is used to do good things and pretend that they're a righteous, godly person who celebrates godliness and righteousness, and we get all confused. Don't do that. Another thing we want to be very careful to remember is that you always want, you're always going to do better under a Jehu than you will under a, godly, a godless, wicked ruler. You're always going to want to pick a Jehu over an Ahab or a Jezebel. I want you to keep those things in mind. Because at the end of the day, we have a ballot that's more of your valid ballot. Let me show you on the screen. What you're going to see more likely is your valid ballot is vote, choose one for president, Harris and Trump. Now, what I did is I, I added some things in parentheses. They're not going to have these on your ballot when you go vote. But I want you to think about when you go in as a follower of Christ to vote, you're not really voting for a person. It's going to look like it, right? It looks like if you check one of these boxes, you're voting for either Harris or you're voting for Trump, that you're voting for a person. But what you're really doing when you go vote is you're voting for a lot of other really important things. And I put those in parentheses. The first thing is you're voting for their policies. When you go vote, if you can detach the name and, and the party and say, who cares about who's Democrat, who's Republican? Who cares whose last name is Trump or Harris? Let's, let's detach that and let's go into and vote for a platform and policies that are backed up by and supported by God's truth. We want to support the people from their policies. Now, here's why, why I say that. Because the other thing I wanted to ask you to consider is this concept of appointments. You see appointments on that list. Do you know that when you go and vote for someone to be elected to the highest office in the land to represent you, that they are responsible for appointing 4,000 people to federal service? The president of the United States at, at the, the, uh, th that serve at the president's will, 4,000 different people that are appointed to live out and work out their policies and their platforms, the way they want the government run. You're not just choosing one person, you're choosing 4,000 other people and a vice president. And uh, those are just the federal appointments. It, even more important than that, on average, for an eight-year term, a president will appoint 350 federal judges. Over an eight-year term, Clinton, Obama, Bush, you look at their terms, all of them had around 350 federal appointments. Trump was about up to like 267 in just one term, would probably surpass 400 appointments if he were given another four years in office. And these are federal judges. I want you to think about this for a moment. From a federal judge perspective, these are lifetime appointments. Whoever's elected next, four years, eight years from now, they won't be able to undo the people that are appointed as judges by the next president of the United States. So we're thinking not just who are we voting for president, but who are we voting for uh, based on their positions and their platform and their policies and who are they going to appoint to positions that will last their, their whole life? Probably a whole generation of time will be affected by those appointments. I want you to consider that. Another thing you consider is their record. When somebody says they're going to do something, they might have an incredible platform, but have a record that shows time and time again they don't live up to what they say they're going to do. If somebody, listen, the best way to get appointed as president of your elementary school, right, is to stand up and say, as a president, I am going to ban all homework. <laughs> and then everybody votes for you, right? 
or I'm gonna, I'm gonna make ice cream free every lunch and then everyone votes for you. But at the end of the day, sometimes people make promises and then their record doesn't match up what they say they're gonna do. And so we get to, we get to look, all right, what do they say they're gonna do? Do they have a record of actually doing what they say? And are they gonna appoint people that back up the platform and policy that are most important to me of, based on the word of God? When you go in to vote, I wanna encourage you to vote with all those things in mind. Now, here's the, here's the deal. I don't think we have, I know we don't have a Jesus on the ballot. I don't think we have a Josiah on the ballot. I don't think that's one of our options. And so what we have to do as, as a people, as citizens, temporary citizens of this world, as members of this church, is we have to essentially figure out who the best person is, the best path forward for voting. Think about this. When you went to pick a spouse, those of you who are married, did you pick a perfect spouse? Guys, I know what you want to do right now. You want to, <laughs> I know you want to say yes and get some kudos, but let's all be real honest right now. You didn't pick a perfect spouse. When you picked a church, those of you who are part of a Rundle Christian church, did you pick a perfect church? No, you didn't. You want to know how I know? Because I'm here and you're here. <laughs> this is not a perfect church. We make mistakes. We do things that are silly. That's not a perfect... When you go pick a movie, when you go to the theater and you're trying to choose which movie to watch, are you ever able to find the perfect movie? No. You just go up and you pick the best available path forward. What are the options? You pick the best one and you move forward with it. And that's essentially what we need to do. I, I, the way I wrote it is this. Voting is your power to pick the best available path forward. Now listen, the government says that as a nonprofit church, I can't endorse a candidate for president. And I'm not going to. And here's why. I, I, I'm fine with not being able to endorse a candidate for president because we have the ultimate voting guide. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some different policy positions and then show you what God's word says and then you can decide how you vote. I'm not gonna tell you how to vote because you got the ultimate voting guide right here. I want you all to vote. I want you to go in and vote according to uh, some of the th stuff we're talking about today. But listen, at the end of the day, the Bible is the ultimate voting guide. And so let's uh, let's look at what the Bible says. Now, here's the problem. The Bible doesn't cover everything. The Bible's not going to have a whole section on infrastructure. It's not going to necessarily give you, like, here's the exact, uh, you know, how big your military is supposed to be at any given moment. It's not going to cover budgets and deficits, and, and it's not going to cover all those things. There's going to be some principles, some, some wisdom in here, uh, but at the end of the day, the Bible doesn't cover a lot uh, uh, some of the stuff, but it does cover most of it. Do you know the Bible covers uh, the issue of life? It covers immigration and borders. You know the Bible covers economic prosperity, biological sex, marriage, parental authority, Israel, and even the environment. You know the Bible covers all these things. And so we get to just go to the Bible and use it as a voting guide. The Bible is the ultimate voting guide. So let me show you now, if you're taking notes again, some, fill in the blanks for you. The first issue I want to talk about is the issue of life. Because I don't have a lot of time to preach. I, I'm, I'm going to go 10 minutes over. I'm already calling it. All right, I'm going to go 10 minutes over today. I'm going to go pretty quick through these. But the issue of life is really important. And what you do is when you go in to vote, you go into that voting booth, you ask yourself this question, which candidate is more likely to protect the unborn? This is something that God's word speaks really clearly on. At Arundel Christian Church, we believe that life begins at conception. And from that moment, we want to protect uh, life. We want to protect the life of the unborn. And so which candidate is more likely to protect that life? Now, here's a bummer. I think both candidates upset me here. I don't think we have a truly uh, pro-life candidate to the place that I would be thrilled Let's look at scripture real fast. Proverbs 8.36 says, All who hate me love death. I don't have this next one on the screen, but Proverbs 6.17 says, God hates the hands that kill the innocent. 
And so I know that God's word says that we got to protect the unborn. And I'm bummed out that neither candidate has as strict of a stance as I would. I'll just tell you what the stances are. I know Trump right now would support a 15-week abortion ban, meaning that you can get an abortion all the way up to 15 weeks, and then after that, you wouldn't be able to, and he would support federal law, making that the law of the land. Now, here's the problem. 95% of abortions happen before 15 weeks. So his current position will only save the lives of 5% of the babies that are currently aborted. Now, the other side of the aisle, uh, I think we have a party that actually celebrates, uh, you know, shout your abortion, uh, mobile abortion RVs showing up to their conventions, rolling outside of things, actually celebrating the killing of innocent life. I think that's far worse, in my opinion. Now, you can, you can figure out where, where you know, the, the, the stats and all that, but let me share with you. I would say that the other side actually celebrates the termination of life all the way through nine months. And actually now in many states, actually beyond. I know that, that people will fact check that. Uh, uh, one of the debates was fact checked where it's like, no, that's not true. But let me give you, you can go look this up. I want you to, to trust me on this, but you can go look it up. In one of our states, the state of Minnesota, where, uh, who's the governor of Minnesota? I forget. All right. I didn't forget. Um, <laughs> there's an act in Minnesota called the Born Alive Infants Protection Act. And this is the actual quoted wording of the act before it was changed. It says that if a baby was, I haven't started quoting yet, right? If a baby was born alive after a botched abortion, here's the quote, the doctors have to preserve the life and health of the born alive infant. That baby must be treated to sustain life. Now, in 2023, that whole phrase that I just quoted was removed from the law, and it was replaced to the doctors must provide care for the infant. The, the actual author of this Born Alive Infant Protection Act was asked, what does that mean? And they said, we now must provide comfort care. So if you have an abortion where a baby is born alive outside of the womb, sitting on a table, all the doctor has to do is give the baby a little bit of morphine while it passes away and dies. Now, let me, let me say this real quick. If you're in this room and you have ever had an abortion, I know this is a really touchy subject. It's very sensitive. It's, it hurts. It, some, I want you to know a couple things. One, Jesus loves you. There's nothing you could ever do that would separate you from the love of God. Nothing, ever. This church loves you. I love you. You're going to be surrounded by people who love you. In fact, we actually have a ministry here called Surrendering the Secret. And it's a private one-on-one uh, -on -one anonymous thing. You go on our website and sign up. You'll be, uh, someone will reach out to you privately and you'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that helps you heal through that and just make sure that you know how much you're loved by God and by his church. Which candidate is more likely to protect the unborn? Here's a second thing that the Bible covers as a voting guide is religious freedom. Here's a question, right? When you go into the voting booth, you ask this question, which candidate is more likely to protect my religious liberty? Which candidate is more likely to protect, if you're a, a doctor, say, and you don't want to perform certain surgeries, which one's more likely to say, listen, you have the religious liberty to not do that if you don't want to? Or you're a business owner, and you don't want to pay for abort-efficient drugs, and you're like, hey, I have the freedom. I want a government that doesn't tell me I have to pay for these things. Or maybe you're a small business owner, you're a photographer or a cake maker, and you want to know that you have the freedom to decide who your clients are and what kind of things you celebrate. And what kind of things you don't. Maybe you, you, from a bodily autonomy perspective, you want to know that the government can never tell you that you are forced to inject something in your body that you don't want to. Which candidate is more likely to protect your religious liberty? Here's number three. I got to go real quick. Gender ideology. Let's talk about gender and all the, the conversation that's going on in our world right now. By the way, God's already spoken into the gender question. We don't have to wonder. We go to Genesis 1:27. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. You ready for this? Male and female, he created them. 
There's not this big spectrum. It's just male and female. He created them. It's right there in Scripture. So here's the question I want to ask you. Which candidate better speaks truth and protects parents' rights and children's bodies from radical gender ideology? Which candidate does that better? What I've learned is that anytime God sets something up, you know, he creates male and female, Satan comes along and his desire is to pervert it, to twist it into something different. And so I want to ask you to consider that if you don't stand up when somebody is speaking up lies and somebody is saying something that aren't true when it comes to gender ideology, that really what you're doing is you're rebelling against the created order. And I would even go further as I say you're contributing to mental illness. You know, one of the parties that's on the ballot, their party actually supports the mutilation of children's bodies and even to the extent where they will take parents' rights away if parents disagree. Again, let's pick on Minnesota for just a moment. I think it's Walsh who's governor now that I think of it. There's a law in effect in Minnesota that was signed by Walls. There's 14 other states that have similar laws that says this. If a parent disagrees with gender-affirming care, the government, you ready for this, can take temporary emergency custody. That the government can take custody of your children because the government thinks that they know better uh, on the question of gender ideology than you do. And so simply ask yourself the question, which candidate understands uh, how to protect our children's bodies and, and, and from, from radical gender ideology and protect parents' rights in making these decisions? Which one? Here's the next one. is border security. You might think, wait, what the Bible talks about border security? You know, in Scripture, there's actually a proverb that says, a man without self-control is just like a city without a wall. The, the chaos that happens when a man doesn't have any borders, doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any self-control, it's like a city without a wall. We also see in Acts 17, verse 26, from one man he created all the nations through the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. We understand that God blessed all throughout Scripture the creation of walls for the protection of people on the inside of those walls. And so I want you to know that while we are certainly called to love immigrants, we are also called to be a people that uphold laws, and there's got to be a way to do both of those things together. There's got to be a right way. And what I would say is that there is nothing loving about borderlessness. I'll give you a few statistics real fast because I'm already over time, so real, real short. And these statistics I'm about to share with you, these aren't made up in my head. They're not from some, you know, uh, weird, wacky website. These are from Department of Homeland Security. There are currently somewhere between 10 and 20 million illegal immigrants in our country. 10 to 20 million illegal immigrants in our country. Now, according to Department of Homeland Security, 425,000 of them are known to have criminal records. Now, that means that a vast majority of the people that have come into our country illegally are, are not criminals. They're not bad people. They're probably very lovely, friendly people. But 425,000 of them are known to have criminal records. Now, get this. 16,000 of them are convicted rapists, and 13,000 of them are convicted murderers. The reason we know those numbers is these are people that were convicted and imprisoned in their country, and their country was like, hey, you know what? It'd be a lot cheaper if we just put them on buses and sent them to America. And so they're living in our boundary, in our country right now, 16,000 convicted rapists. Here's my thought on it. I know that God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. I know that when he created all things, right? And he created a garden, not a jungle. And what did he put around that garden? If it had a gate, <laughs> it had a wall. God is a God of order. There's nothing loving about borderlessness. So here's the question. Which candidate will better protect our national security? I want you to ask that question. Again, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. 
By the time I'm done with this list, if you don't know how I'm voting, you're probably not paying attention, but. <laughs> Here's the next one, Israel. I'm gonna go super quick. Genesis 12, three says, I will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who treat Israel with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through Israel. So here's our simple question. When you walk in to vote, which candidate will more fully support Israel? Something to consider. All right, here's the next one, parental rights. Which candidate knows that parents are the best suited to train up their own children? Which candidate believes that you as a parent, that you know what's best for your children? See, one of the, the parties, I believe, would love to see parents and families slowly give away their rights over to the government. The government is saying, listen, we'll take over all that responsibility. Let us decide for you, parents, what, what to do in each of these situations. Here's an example. I believe that sometimes the government says things like this. Hey, we'll do the providing here. And then you find a bunch of people dependent on government handouts because the government's done all the providing. Or the government will say, hey, you know, We'll do the protecting here. Just give us your guns, and we'll do all the protecting. Or a government that says, we'll do the educating here, instead of you getting to decide what educational choice is best for your children, which school is best, what type of education is best. The government would love to have say over that for you and give you no say in it. Sometimes the government says things like, hey, you know what? We're going to establish the values around here. We used to want to just teach reading and writing and arithmetic, but we're now going to decide what values are important to instill in your children. Oh, and by the way, parent, if you want to have any say in that at all, you're a domestic terrorist. Number two, how to not punch your neighbor. Let's talk about this for just a moment. How to not punch your neighbor. In Romans 13, 1, it says, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now, let me tell you why I included this verse. It's a super important verse in understanding Scripture. On Tuesday, either Harris or Trump is going to be elected president. We might not know on Tuesday. We probably won't know on Tuesday. We might not know until January, maybe not even then. But someone is going to be elected president. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, we know that Scripture tells us that God is aware of who's serving in leadership at all moments in time. Right there. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. Now, here's the ex exceptions. If the government tells you not to do something that God commands, or the government tells you not or to do something that God forbades, it's our job to tell the government to go pound sand. Amen. Like, I'm not doing it. You don't have more say over me and my family than God does. But where the government is asking us or, or writing laws and things that, that aren't already given out and, and established through Scripture— our job, regardless of who's elected president, is to submit to the governing authorities. No matter how much we like the governing authorities, no matter how the election goes, if it goes in your favor or your, someone else's favor, it doesn't matter. So here's three quick things. Your last fill in the blanks. I'm going to give these to you real quick because I'm over time. I want you to write down that your enemy is not flesh and blood. Satan wants you to credit other people, to hate other people, to, to cause division amongst the church and to cause division amongst your neighbors, cause division at work. Satan wants to, to mess a bunch of things up and then make you blame other people for it. The truth is that our enemy is not other people. The Bible's really clear that our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's the, the, the powers of this world of darkness. Satan and his demons are trying to cause division, and so it's our job to not go out and punch our neighbor. They're not the enemy. Here's the second thing. Write this down. You have been called to love your neighbor. That's the opposite, I think, of punching them. Doesn't matter if they're 
you know, what signs they have in their front yard. It doesn't matter how they vote. It doesn't matter how annoying they are about their positions in comparison to yours. It doesn't matter any of that. We're called to show the love of Jesus to all people. And and the third thing I want you to write down is no matter who the president is, you probably already guessed this one. You ready? Jesus is on the throne. No matter who the president is, Jesus is on the throne. And we can rest in, in, in awareness of that and that truth. We can know that at the end of the day, Jesus is ruling on the throne. So for our what now, God, this morning, I want to start with a quote from Frederick Douglass. If you know your history, uh, you know that Frederick Douglass, you know, you know who Frederick Douglass is, and, and this quote will, will be more meaningful to you. Here's what he says. I will unite with anyone to do right and no one to do wrong. I will unite with anyone to do right things and no one to do wrong things. And so my encouragement for us and our what now, God, is simply this. I want, listen, you don't have to be enthusiastic about your vote. I promise you, regardless of you figured out who I'm voting for, I can tell you this wholeheartedly, I am not enthusiastic about my vote. I'm not super excited about the options that I have. But we still need to go vote. We need to vote for the best available path forward. I gave you some questions to consider. I want you to use God's word as your voting guide when you go cast your vote. Vote for policies that line up with your faith. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this voting guide that we have in front of us. Thank you for this church that that you've called me to pastor. I pray that you would allow us to be unified. I know in this room right now, there are people who disagree with a lot of what I said. There's people who are gonna celebrate what I said. At the end of the day, we know that we are brothers and sisters in Christ who agree on the core essentials of faith and that we have an opportunity to in unity have our voice heard by going and voting. And God, I pray that we'd be a church that votes according to the values that you've instilled into us in your word. And we ask that you'd give us the courage and the the strength and the grace to, to recognize regardless of how the election goes, that you are always on your throne, you are always in control, you are always good, you are always just, and that our neighbors are not the enemy. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.